Good morning. Good to be with you all here this morning. If you got your Bibles, uh, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. As you can tell, I'm not originally from the Philadelphia area. I come from Greenville, South Carolina, so if there's a little bit of an accent when I read the King James, don't fault the King James, fault me. Um, let me ask you all this. How many of you have ever heard the Bible read in English? I hope everybody's hand goes up because you just heard uh, Mr. Sorkness read it to you. Let me just say this as you're looking up 2 Timothy 3. The reason that you're able to do that is precisely because the King James Bible exists. You wouldn't have an English translation like you have today without the King James Bible. That's how important it is. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is not a church history lecture. I want to talk to you about the sufficiency of God's Word. And that word sufficiency, we mean that it lacks nothing. Scripture lacks nothing for life and for godliness. And so we want to look at that together this morning. And we'll read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 9 through 17, but I'm going to preach from 2 Timothy 3.16. So let us give our reverent and diligent attention to the reading and hearing of God's holy, inspired, and therefore inerrant word given here by the Apostle Paul to us. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs was also. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly lives in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Pray with me. Father, we ask now for the gracious help of your Holy Spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you this day, you who are our rock and our redeemer in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. The sufficiency of Scripture taught so clearly here in this verse that Paul writes to Timothy. And you see, as Paul comes to talk to his young pastor friend Timothy, he's concerned that false teachers have arisen. He's concerned that false living, following from false teaching, and bad living is occurring. And he wants Timothy to have a touchstone, to have a rock, to have one place that he can go to always when Paul is gone to know how people should live and to know what they should believe. Hence, the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, what do the Scriptures principally teach? The Scriptures principally teach what men are to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of men. And that's right out of this verse here. So I want to look at two points very quickly with you this morning from verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. First point, the Scriptures are sufficient for doctrine. And that's because of their source. Paul says here, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now sometimes you may think about something that's being inspired. Somebody sings an inspired song. I mean, it was really good. It just moved you. Or you heard a band and that was just inspiring to you. You read a story and that's inspiring. That's not at all what Paul means here. Not at all what Paul means. Paul's using a a Greek word here that means God-breathed. That's quite literally what he says. He says the Scriptures are the breath of God. So that when we hear the Scriptures preached or when we read them, it's as if God Himself were speaking to us, beloved. Is that your view of the Bible? Let me ask you that right off the bat. Is that how you look at this book? That it's God's very words to you. And therefore, free from error, there is not one single error of fact or doctrine in this book. Science will never prove this book wrong. There's no conflict between the Bible and science precisely because the Bible contains all truth. 
Because God Himself is truth. That's Paul's point to Timothy. Don't worry about human opinions, Timothy. Don't worry about false teachers. Come back to the source of doctrine and life, which is the Bible alone. That was one of Martin Luther's championing cries of the Reformation. And therefore, if this is God speaking, and it is, it carries the same authority as God. So that when you hear the Bible preached and when you read it yourself, it is God teaching you. Perhaps rebuking you. And in any event, speaking to you. And so the only truly inspired book in the world is this book from God precisely because it's expired from God. What do I mean by that? It's breathed out by Him, dear ones, so that this is the Word of God. Not just contains the Word of God, not might be the Word of God if modern people come to the conclusion that yes, we should listen to this book. No, it is because of who it comes from. It comes from God. That's Paul's point to Timothy. But the Scriptures are sufficient for doctrine, and that is because of what they teach, not just because of their source, but because of what they teach. Notice what Paul says there. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Now what kind of things is he thinking about here when he talks to us that the Scriptures are inspired and they are profitable for us for doctrine? At least a few things, right? The Scriptures teach us who God is. There's no other way to know God. The same way that you can as, if you, as you read from the Scriptures. They teach us that God is holy, that He is just, that He punishes sin. Things that you've probably heard all your lives. I didn't have that privilege. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't become a Christian until after college. I didn't know God. But the Scriptures, when I opened them up and started reading them, they teach me who God is. And they also teach us about ourselves. The Bible's the only place that's going to give you the truth about who you are. Not psychology, not the modern news media, not the songs you listen to, not the movies you watch, not the TV shows you watch. They do not give you the full truth. The Scriptures do, and they are unwavering in this point about you and me after Adam. That is that we're sinners. We're fallen. And we're creatures under God's authority. And the way He exercises that authority is through this book, not through a pope, not through a church council. Those, the church councils are helpful. We look back to the early church and we learn from them. But certainly never through a pope or any other man like that. Period. That was Martin Luther's point. So their script, they teach us about God, they teach us about ourselves, and blessedly, beloved, they teach us about salvation. That the only way of salvation, and be clear on this in your minds as students, it's going to be challenged when you go to college, right? But be clear on this, that Jesus Christ is the only way to know God. You maybe have heard it said today that all paths lead to God, right? Believe what you want to believe. What works for you, that's fine. Believe that. You know, and I want to say to you that all paths do, in fact, lead to God. Every religion leads to God. Only one of them leads to God in grace. Every other path that leads to God leads to His judgment because it's false, because it's not based on this Word, dear ones. So the Scriptures teach us about God, about ourselves, about salvation. And these are some of the most important things that you will ever consider in your lives, aren't they? What's more important this morning than knowing God and in that act, knowing yourself and in knowing what God desires of you and how to be saved? There's nothing more important. That's not to, to downplay the other subjects. I don't want your teachers getting mad at me. Yes, you must pay attention in every single class. And yes, let me assure you, you need to learn those math problems. All right, as a doctoral student, I didn't do too well in math when I was your age. Now it's coming back to haunt me. Pay attention there. Pay attention to everything they say. But let me say this to you as well. Every subject you study, from math to literature to science to whatever it is, is always subordinate. It's always subservient. It's always under the Scriptures. This is the most important thing for you to study for the rest of your lives. And it will never grow old. The Scriptures are a living word because they're breathed out by God because the Holy Spirit working with them is God breathing to us today as well. So these are the living word of God because the living word of the living God. And so this truth that God gives us in His word is not found anywhere else. Don't be swayed by people who tell you, you know, if you just read scientific literature enough, if you just listen to the opinions of most people today who are scientists and experts, they'll tell you that this book can't be trusted, 
and you really should just give up that Sunday school belief that the Bible is all you need. And I want to challenge that directly this morning and challenge you to think for yourself and not base your thinking on anything but the Word of God. doesn't mean you can't learn things. In fact, if you're a Christian here this morning, you should be the best scientist, the best person writing literature, the best artist, the best athlete, precisely because you're doing these things to the glory of God. So don't hear me saying, well, you know, don't pay attention to all them scientists. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying to you is that when they tell you that this book is wrong, they have thereby said God is a liar. And pardon me if I don't want to stand on the side of people who call the living God, who's going to judge all men in righteousness, who is a consuming fire, a liar. And neither should you. That's not where you want to be. Trust me. And just read through the scriptures and see what happens when somebody questions God's word. Let me assure you it does not go well. God doesn't take that lightly. And therefore, the only source for truth on all subjects is the Scriptures. Anything that contradicts them is false and a lie. Period, dear ones. That's Paul's point here, Timothy. That's what he's saying to my young pastor friend. Don't be swayed by anything else. And we need to hear that today as well. And then as well, we need to hear that it's not just we don't need to pay attention to those who are so-called experts who want to contradict the Bible. We have our own opinions about things, don't we? Have you ever said that to yourself? Or heard somebody else say that? Well, I think God is like. Or I think, you know, salvation is like. If that's what you've said before, you're contradicting God's word. Frankly, that's your opinion, and it doesn't matter much. Don't mean to be offensive there, but God tells you how to be saved. God tells you what he's like. It doesn't matter what you and I think about it. If it doesn't match up with the word of God, Paul is saying you've abandoned it. You've abandoned the Word of God at that point by saying, well, I think it's such and such. No, we come back to the all-sufficient, lacking nothing Word of God. And what's amazing, dear ones, is that this gives you freedom. Now, I know there's voices today saying that the only true freedom comes when you break away from what your parents have taught you at home, or you break away from what your pastors tell you in church, or you break away from every kind of authority structure. And let me tell you what that actually does, ironically. It leads to enslavement. Because if you don't have the Word of God testing all your opinions, testing all the opinions of other people, do you know what's going to happen? You're just going to be following other people's opinions for the rest of your lives. You're going to have no sure word from God, so you're going to be at the whim and at the will of the latest person who comes along who seems to know what he or she's talking about. Then that person will be exposed, and you'll see, well, actually, they didn't know what they were talking about. And you're going to be in big trouble because you're going to be following right along with them. Let me say the courage to think for yourself begins by thinking through the scriptures. 